We'll start with the uh, the gong bang. Here we go. Just to set off proceedings on the right footing. And then this is where it crashes. Oh, I should put that thing away. I need some better way to uh, have a gong on hand, you know, some kind of portable gong. But the smaller they get, the, the sound gets too um, tinny, doesn't it? You need a kind of a large gong. So, what am I doing? Well, I'm doing my usual thing where I'm taking the uh, Goodman Games books, which includes the main DCC role playing book, which is a thick tome with plenty of information in there for creating adventures. Um, I'm also using the monster alphabet, and uh, that's a, a very handy if I can get the focus right. So if I get the focus right, this on this I should be okay for everything else. So yeah, that's the monster alphabet where you can like make monsters and work through um, uh, details as you create them. Anything from making them spit acid to have a variety of magical effects. And then one of my favourite books also, because it's got stunning cover and I'm always showing this off, is the Dungeon Alphabet. So uh, Michael Curtis's book where it um, takes you through sort of populating a dungeon. So I've been making use of that for all of the sort of room setup and things in there. Let's get that on the Peter Mullen artwork there. Yeah, so I say I've um, there's some fantastic artwork in this book, by the way. Uh, nearly every other page has sort of got stuff, so it's not just tables, although there are table, straight table pages like this as well. Here we go, this one's handy. 20 unforeseen developments during a battle. I haven't used that, actually. Now I've seen that, I'm going to use that uh, today. So uh, here I try and find a bookmark to remind myself, but I haven't got anything to hand. There I have. I've got a printout, actually, from a, an adventure. Um, some people hanging off chains from a DCC adventure. So I'll use that events thing that I just randomly threw up there. And I've got my dice, my funky dice and sort of traditional dice as well. And by funky dice, I mean Dungeon Crawl Classics has um, these more interesting dice types that go up to sort of D30. And you've got nearly everything in between D16s, um, D3s, which is really only a half a D6, isn't it? I think there's a D7. Is there in there? It's definitely a D5. That's a D7 as well. So yeah, they're fun because they're used within the uh, game itself. So where am I on the adventure? Let's switch over then to the Raspberry Pi. And this is where I'm putting the adventure into my um, Google Doc. And as I work through I've been uh, filling out this up. What am I on now? 24 pages, starting with the map at the top and the setting, which is called Scarpsy. And then you've got the Oblix, which is the main target of the adventure, where there's a goddess that's dying in there. And she's looking for uh, some followers, maybe a patron or two, because she's got no one that believes in her anymore because this Oblix was transported in a sort of magical uh, portal uh, a thousand years ago from another realm and that's where she was worshipped but here no one um, is listening or thinking about her anymore although the locals did for a while worship them they've now long forgotten her um, yeah so Cliff's End is where the adventure started and um, in the last couple of se sessions I've been detailing that very start moment you know going off the model of the DCC adventures where it tries to get you straight into the action no messing about um, and uh, you sort of plough straight into finding things happening to you. So just recap last week. So I've got all the classic introduction. I've got a bit of detail about Idenea Waynes. She's the goddess that's slowly dying um, and who worshipped her. And then the Correctionist, which is, I started to detail this last week. The Correctionist is like a mini sun um, and he kind of controlled that temple, the Oblix, in the previous realm. And he's kind of semi-automaton, mechanical. It's a, like a basketball or large pumpkin-sized um, monster that's a sun, essentially, that can spit fire and things like that. Although I haven't done the stats, and that's the first thing I'm going to do today, is I'm going to do the statistics for that by working through things in there. And also, I like, because that's the the one of the final battles against the ultra with the mini sun controlling them and 
uh, attacking the players in that dungeon, the Oblix. I'm going to use that table that I saw in that dungeon alphabet page there where it said um, that uh, events that happen during a battle, because I thought that would be interesting, so sort of throw things up a bit that something different happens there during that fight. Um, so adventure background so it starts in uh, Cliff's End and there's a funeral um, and we've said here as you arrive in Cliff's End there's a lot of activity and a large crowd of 30 or more people are in the main cobbled village square which has a statue on a plinth in the centre. It's full and the few trees around the edge of the square have shed their leaves. The village square is located in the middle of the cross aisles and just up from the stone bridge over the river Oddpole. So that's the village um, here of Cliss End, that's the river Oddpole running through there, and there's the bridge into like the village square here. Um, so this is where the players will sort of be introduced to the um, adventure essentially. And um, just before I dive in anymore, I'm just going to check my stream because when you're live like this, it's like you know somewhere it's the sound's not working or something else won't be <laughs> won't won't be live. So I'm just checking. Okay, so it looks like it's uh, live. Okay. And let me just check Twitch. Yeah, I can't say that there's any issues there. It looks okay. So please shout and make a comment wherever you happen to be, uh, particularly if you're in Twitch at all. You're always interested to hear. So I'm going to type in there hello in the Twitch comments and just see that that's going out there too. Yes, that worked. So there we go. Um, back then to the desktop and the uh, the next stage scrolling on down so yeah i usually mention i'm always going to do this just to sort of say i use a, a a raspberry pi i've got here which is a type of single board computer and there it is raspberry pi sbc single board computer in fact i've got linux loaded on there and that's what i'm running at the moment here which you can see and um, you can see it has that little raspberry icon in the top left hand side but it's basically a little uh, a desktop that's really easy to set up and i can run the usual uh, browser-based applications like google's uh, docs here which is what i'm using to draft all this i mean the idea is that as i get through this i'll, I'll potentially publish this either a small self-publish or a pdf uh, or whatever I end up doing with it, but it will move into Adobe um, InDesign, which I've used for a couple of other game books that I've published in the past. So I'll stick it in there and hopefully I'll do a couple of sessions where I'll show some of the layout in InDesign as well. Just if you're interested in the publishing side of things, it's, it might be worth doing it. So back to that first encounter, which I updated last week, just to sort of run through what, what where things start right at the start of the adventure. So they're arriving in Cliff's End, they're in the cobbled village square. It's full, it's quiet, but there's a funeral procession going through. So there's a small crowd gathered to the, the view to view the funeral of Alkid Smark, a local farmer with a large family that resides to the east of Cliff's End. A red flower festooned funeral cart is dragged by a pair of oxen. I was going to make it horses, but I thought big oxen would be interesting. Um, with unlockers in various states of grief, uh, traipsing along beside it. As is traditional here, a small herd of truffle pigs. I've said. I don't know why I called them truffle pigs. They're just pigs, but I like the phrase truffle pigs. Uh, they're also in the procession, some of which will be slaughtered for the feast after the burial. And then I've said the, because that's be quite interesting as well, you know, drag them along. It's like a, you do get villages and places that do like to slaughter things. And the cart slowly passes the square's central statue and is pulled on past the village. <clears throat> is there an apostrophe missing in Alkin's Not Dead? Um, there's probably is actually, so thanks for popping that out, Adam Matt. Admin Matt even. Ad Adam, I called it Adam Matt. That's, that's no wonder I've got some typos in there. There is, look at it, it's even saying it to me. Oh no, all kids is what it wants to say. Yeah, so I could uh, I could stick an apostrophe in there. There we go. So a sudden cry escalates. Um uh, to a howl and the crowd starts screaming some dropping to the floor or something so this is the longest read aloud I've actually got in the book as well um, in the in the adventure normally I thought because it's the start it's the sort of thing we need a little bit more of a, a read aloud but I don't want large read alouds and that's one of the things I've tried to keep short um, 
So the funeral follows with a guttural scream causing the gathering to scatter. One local uh, shouts, our kid's not dead. Uh, the pigs in the square run wild, squealing, adding to the chaos. I did wonder about how to bring the, ki the pigs into the fight um, with our kid charging at them. We could, uh, think they could be picked up. He could pick them up and throw them, roll them. They could charge into the players, just uh, had a sort of interesting feel. I've always liked that kind of Western style of uh, scene where you potentially, you know, a gunfight's going on, but then you've got cattle charging through or something and it just makes things a bit more difficult. But that's up to the, the judge at this point whether they want to, to do that. So, yeah, basically I made him up last week. Oh, Samuel's back. Hello, Samuel. Thanks for, for joining the live stream. So, yeah, I made this guy up last week, our kid Smark. Um, so I've just called him a bloated undead. And he's a large farmer. He's just been woken by the sudden beating heart of Idonair, the goddess in the, um, the slow beating heart. His primitive auction starved, recently dead mind, heads him straight for the stranger in the village square at a fast pace. And I said he's actually hoping to find help for his confused predicament by heading towards outsiders. But sadly, his wild running guttural howls, foul stench and frantic clawing only give the impression he wants to kill them. So I've said that he's got plus three attack. I've given him two attacks. So he's got two claws. So this is quite a vicious starting fight. Um... Oh, thanks. Thanks. I'm, I'm glad I'm your current fave. I've only got a few fans. <laughs> uh, you're like one of like two or three, but uh, thanks very much. And uh, so essentially um, I've given him the claw attack, which is only 1d4 damage. But in addition to that, I've got ice touch. So I've said that when his claws strike, they will do an extra 1d4 as well. So he can pump out quite a lot of damage, but he hasn't got a huge amount of hits. Um, how many hit points though? I said 3d6. Um, so I might just roll 3d6 now and just see how that rolls out just while I'm at it um, and give it and take what's written in there. I know you could sort of average what the hit dice are, but if I roll it, I'll be quite sort of pleased to take what's going to come up there. So he has 3d6 in hand. Oh, I'm not going to take that. <laughs> <laughs> Evil DM, look how low that was. 12 hit points. That's probably fair, actually. Um, I think that's fair amount. So um, I haven't put his hit points down there, actually. I've put Exploding Guts special. Um, I normally put the hits down here, actually. So I will write them in there. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, what am I going to give him? 12 or 10? I'm going to give him 12 hit points. So, yeah, and I'll just say, uh, oh, next to that guts, I'll just put guts special SP. Well, that's not going to fit in there. Yeah. So, although moving fast, he's a large extended power swell in his stomach, which is marked with large weeping sores, causing him to waddle into his run causing a waddle to his run. Both slender clawed hands have a pale frosty blue hue to them. So that's something worth pointing out. Again, that's just like um, triggering a thought for the players, isn't it? This thing runs at them and they and they can see it's huge and bloated. Um, but, you know, why has he got blue, blue pale, long slender hands that are clawed? That's slightly wrong and that might mean something, which will give them a, hopefully a bit of a scare. So he's normal undead. This has come from the DCC book. He's immune to sleep, charm paralysis, as well as other mental effects and cold damage. And I've said on a successful hit, he'll add 1d4. And I've said on a reduction to zero hits, Alkid's swollen guts will explode, covering the party in gore and rubbery stinking entrails with a hint of apple smell to the gore. Uh, he's a regular drink of cider, and in death his intestines will turn to an acidic mucus mush. All characters within 20 foot will be covered in intestinal spray and take 1d4 acid damage and I've said that they can make a reflex of d4 d4 d14 dc14 because reflex is the standard you know for dungeon crawl classics for those that are unfamiliar with the rules um, dungeon crawl classics uses the old sort of three 3.5 uh, uh, save group of three you know the reflex will um, stamina I <laughs> can't remember yeah reflex will and stamina so you've got the three uh, to pick from so I've said that uh, they need to do that and but unfortunately even if they succeed they still get a small splash which results in this one hit point per round 
So there it is. Uh, then I've also, there's a, I ruled up in the book that the statue of Ignart Rocksmith, uh, that the statue that I mentioned at the start that they say is, um, is depicting a small boy drawing a boat to fire into the sky at his feet as a coal dragon, which is part of the base of the statue. And an open book beside the dragon's resting head has some arcane text. If someone is a wizard, they can read, say, Idenae's heart shall protect the ser from the serpent. During the commotion, it, so this is an old statue, so I wonder if it says this is a very, I should say on close incident, this very old statue. It's antique looking. So it may well have been around for, you know, 60, 70 years or whatever, because it's like been about 100 years since they worshipped or had any knowledge of Idana. She's just sort of drifted out. Now she's just a, a myth. Um, uh, no one act actively worships her. And I said, during the commotion, if they look in the direction of the statue, they may catch a glimpse of the bronze shape blurring slightly and turning to aim its bow at them. Uh, however, on a second glance, it looks to be as solid and unmoving as any other bronze statue and pointing the boy skywards. Yes, so antique statue with antique design, make it seem more professional. So yeah, that's it. It's a old looking thing. And I rolled in the d dungeon um, alphabet that the statue would have this glance over at them. So again, it's adding a bit of a spooky element to it, isn't it? That they look up. Is that thing pointing its arrow at us? What's going on? Um, it's just some a hint of something to come, isn't it? So then I've said here, I need this hook to lead the players to the barrows, because that's the Cliffs End Barrows scene, to go and explore the rocks, uh, the, uh, the Rocksmith family's tomb. And the reason for that is because of the people who are waking from the, the dead as they're buried, and, and the local villagers need some help. So I need to probably create a, a local um, sort of burgomaster type character that's going to make the suggestion that the players explore the uh, barrows to try and put an end to whatever it is that's causing the dead to wake. I'm not going to do that right now though, so I'm going to go and do the um, creature. Um, the correctionist inside the oblix. So I shall go back up to just remind us where that is. And here it is, beneath the Valley of the Ultra Knolls. So the obelisk is the central uh, dungeon, which is a strange black obsidian thing. I don't know why I came up with word oblix. It probably means something. I don't know. Um, but I've stuck that there and it's got an entrance in the top. So it was the second layer of here. So if you've been following through any of these um, lengthy videos, um, it's the second dungeon level inside the oblix, starting at the top where you go in. The first level they meet Idenir. The second level is where the Ultranoles reside, which are the namesake of the working title of the adventure. And uh, I shall skip right down to it now then. And just wanted to sort of cover off that last uh, bit there. So that's the barrow and the grave warmers there. So I've gone past that. Uh, there's my barrow map. This is something I haven't done to the oblix yet. On the barrow, I, I edited the drawing to add things like um, an etched um, carved dragon um, I want to call it a mural, but it's like a floor carving, um, plus the, this stone object that's made of the same obsidian and features um, a, a mini view of the oblique. So it looks like, you know, when this tomb in the barrow was made, it was at a point in time where there was some worship that was related to the uh, oblix. And in this one, there's an unusual monster which is wrapped around a statue. Uh, with a sonic attack and uh, it's like the final room of the of the barrows and there's another statue in there i just want to remind myself of the monster in that room seven because it was quite an interesting one that came up it's a bit a bit wacky really uh, i sort of rolled it up and there's the different rooms here it is the ibis which is in room The worship room, a large room with dry cracked flagstones with a raised at central area, 10 foot tall dragon statue made of mottled black and grey granite. Attention is immediately drawn to a golden glowing beast that's curled around the base of the dragon. The beast has a body and oversized lion with a long elongated neck featuring a lengthy beak and half a dozen eyes lock onto whoever has ever entered the room. So it's an avatar of Idenea. She's left it here to guard the dragon statue of 
Gaclagansthorn, who is the ancient black dragon. Now, this is a working name, because I think it's a bit of a mouth, mouthful to say that dragon name. Although I kind of like the sort of length of it. Gaclagansthorn. It's okay. Ancient Black Dragon is still alive and currently residing in the north beyond Covenark, which is where the, the dwarf mountain range is. So the Roxas family worshipped the dragon, and by placing a statue in the tomb, they dedicated themselves to her. So I said the statue has let its lower jaw... The statue has had its lower jaw removed, and the broken part is beneath the avatar's foot. If the dragon's lower jaw is replaced, Gaclagansthorn will be alert to the presence of Idenia, the god, and will rise from the ancient slumber to investigate the obelisks. Um, with the statue incomplete, like the Gansel has been blind to the presence of the god within her territory. So yeah, they could uh, they could find that if they kill the beast and replace the bit of the statue, there's going to be a dragon on the scene later on in some form or another, or at least the next hook on this adventure after it ends will maybe introduce the dragon. Uh, the avatar will not attack in, uh, unless it's either attacked itself or someone approaches in ten foot of the statue. And this is this weird ibis avatar with the the, the the lion body, which I rolled up in the um, the monster alphabet. But I've given it a sonic spear attack, and this thing's quite a, a good attack. It's also got two attacks around uh, with two claws. So I said it's a mon oversized eight foot long lion's body and long long head of an ibis. Um, but this special sonic spear is once per round. The ibis avatar will scream with a thunderous howl, releasing a spear of sound. This visible wave of piercing. Let's call it a visible rippling wave of piercing sound can target out to 60 foot and the ibis is able to both see and fire its screeching spirit sound through walls up to a thickness of 5 foot. So that was it. Sort of a fight in there. So let's get down to the obliques then and the creature that I'm going to create now and just roll that up. So there's the first level of the obliques when they come down through that top of the chamber. Um, and walk down the steps from the surface of the black uh, cube oblix and i think i can there it is right in the middle there the oblix and you can see um it's got some stairs right in the center if you look right into that ravine where the oblix is uh, that's where you walk down into it and there was also a little kind of adventure bit where they had to sort of find a way onto it as well um, which we could probably do with some more detail on that and then the second level um uh, so the first level, there's a giant crab in a, in a pool in there. Corridors, skeletons, jade bones, slightly different skeletons which I've created there. And then the goddess herself, which I'm going to do another episode of this, which I think might be next week. Depends how hot it is, because it's weltering here in the UK today, so I'm only going to really go out to about an hour and a bit. Because um, I'm getting hot under the lights in here. Um, I just don't want to put my fan on because then you just hear a constant fan. So yes, go scrolling down to get the level two. So here we go. Just the general view of this is that this is where they enter here. There's a large mounted barbarian like uh, statue here and a, and a door that has a spirit of an old. Um, oh, you're from the UK. You're hot here too. Yeah, I'm south of London in the UK. So it's very, uh, very warm here today. Um, you know, it's like Mediterranean temperatures, isn't it really? So this door here, in, I've said it's a massive wooden door, but it's actually a door uh, with some spikes on it. That's where they come in. They need to negotiate with the door. There's actually a statue on the floor above that if they've read an inscription on it, they can read this inscription to the person in there, uh, in the spirit of the person that's locked in the door, and he'll let them through. You know, I can't help but think that's slightly labyrinth-like, isn't it, with the sort of faces on the door talking, but it kind of, that's their way into there. Then there's like a, a race of um, albino um, creatures in here, in this pool, um, which are like servitors for the cleaning of the um, genetically created servitors for the cleaning air. And I haven't said they'd fight, but I thought it would be quite interesting, again, um, having a bunch of creatures in there that are weird-looking. They have their own little home they reside in here um, and they're having a bath <laughs> in like a steamy bath and they all look round at the players when they march in but of course there's no that they've got no speech they're just uh, servitors that get on with things but at the moment they're in rest mode and they're all chilling out like a family in the uh, water so that's the first sort of encounter when they come into the main temple and then this is the main encounter in there in five um, so the antechamber is where the um, 
and the intelligent door is with the spirits of a stuck-up, privileged old priest of the temple called Ijax, and since his death has been bound into the door uh, to first check for the rites of passage for visitors. Ijax is waiting for the inscription from 2A on the first floor to be read aloud before the door will clank loudly open and the spikes will attract because the door is covered in spikes. So I was going to put some treasure on there, I think. I was going to put some um, a chain shirt. So... I said patches. I'm going to say with a with a fine looking chain shirt, still in good shape. Various visitor, so series of ugly spikes on it with the remains of previous visitors resting over the doors. I'll just say hooked. Oops. Oh, don't want to select it all. Oh, just want that hooked. <laughs> uh, hooked over the door's sharp metal hooks, uh, with fine looking with a fine looking chain shirt still in good shape. So really, I the door is intelligent. And uh, if they don't read it, if angered by the visitors, Ijax will shout command and the rushing and the rusting iron mounted statue in the room will animate an attack. If one of the player characters speaks the phonetically memorized phrase from the base of the silver statue in the pool room, Ijax. I'll just write 2A again there. Ijax will allow the group through and the statue will calmly return to its resting place. So the interesting thing with the iron golem, as I've said, that it's got a spear. Um, it's got two attacks, so it can basically kick with its horse or spear. And I'll tell you what, I haven't given its hit points there, so I'm going to roll these while I'm here as well. I've got 2d8 here I can roll, and just see what that uh, comes up with. Let's go to the desk, just start making sure all these things are filled in. So that's not bad, I mean that's 8, I rolled a 1 and a 7. And then the next two, okay, so... We've got 19, it's got 19 hit points. It's quite powerful then really, but uh, quite happy to do that. 19. So yeah, that's quite good. 19 hit points. Uh, so I've said the iron, oh, I've lost that. The iron metal has 50 hit chance to surprise the characters and where it jumps from the statue uh, life, statue form. It will get a free single attack and attempt to charge a player in front of the door. If kicked by the horse, a player can be forced back five foot uh, and may resist. <laughs> and may resist, which they'll want to do by making a reflex save decently to avoid being pushed back. If the spike door is directly behind a player forced back into it, they will suffer D3 damage from the spike. So it was just a sort of hint that it will kick them into the spikes of the door. Uh, so it's one of its attacks. And then I'm just skipping to the main the main area. So this was the big final showdown. So this is a large stone tiled room with a vaulted roof and features a range of beds and a row of kitchen-like equipment and tables um, toward the northeast. In the centre of the room can be seen 11 tall figures and they are currently in prayer sitting in a circle around that looks like a mini sun hanging in the air above the middle of the room. They look tanned and leathery from basking in the sun's light. Although sitting cross-legged, I'll just say they're humans. The tall, I'll just say, toned looking. Toned and topless. I said toned and tad. The tall, toned looking, tanned and. No, that hasn't worked. The tall looking. Tall, tanned and leathery humans look strong and fit whilst basking in the mini sun's light. Although sitting cross legged and worshipping the mini sun, they look ready for battle with chain shirts, quilted battle skirts. Kilts, in other words, 
um, and swords scabbards by their sides. Oops. The mini sun, which is about the size of a basket weaver's basket. That's what I came up with last last week, but I'm going to just say it's about the size of a large pumpkin. And it's called the Correctionist. It's duty bound to protect and manage the behaviour of the Ultra Gnolls. However, it is now Ultra Gnoll worshippers. The Ultra Gnoll of the resident, temple resident, Ultra Gnoll worshippers. However, it has now managed. I managed them through nearly 20 generations within the Oblix Temple and keeps the population set to just 11 gnolls. It's original duty. Oh, thanks, Admin Matt, for the a poetic comment. I wonder which bit I was reading specifically. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, the Crestus will scream out does the Crestus speak? Well, I think it will, because I've said it will scream out instructions to the Ultronauts to attack the players. The only thing is, do I put a, a read aloud there? I, I probably should put a comment, really, for the judge to say, and I've spelled pumpkin wrong. It wants to be an image of a large pumpkin, yeah. I was thinking whether large pumpkin just does sort of make you think there's a pumpkin in the in the sky. It's probably quite evocative, um, but really it doesn't look like that. It is just like a little shining sun that's difficult to look at. Um, which reminds me, I should actually, that's a good point actually, if it's difficult to look at. I'll take this stat block um, for, the, for the correctionist. Do another one there and pop it in here. Oh, I'll have in there. Oh, maybe if I don't do that and just get rid of the... and I'll just say an automaton or something so yeah I've got to think about that now I'm just dropping that in there so I'm ready to put the uh, statistics in so the ultra nodes themselves I've only given them one attack I've said that I have berserker which is something I pulled from the DCC book so they've got um, a good initiative the sword is plus three um, and I'll just call them I'll just say humans on here and yeah, I gave them Berserker, and basically that Berserker means that uh, the Ultra Nolls are six foot tall muscle humans with six female and five male warriors. Um, I probably just sort of should say they they wear shirts with. Kilts and sandals. They wear chainsaws with quilts and sandals and show great poise when standing to join the fight. I've said after they take any sort of damage, uh, they're Eyes will flare with a red light and a wild rage will take over the body. Uh, body with muscles rippling and faces deformed into the shape of raging beasts. They gain five hit points and plus two to all attacks, damage and saving throws. After two turns, the madness fades and they lose the extra hit points or they will still retain the beast heads. So they've taken more hits than their base hit points would provide. Good points, they die. Yeah, Garden State pumpkins are huge, aren't they? We're over here in the UK. Oh, they do make champion-sized pumpkins here. Um, 
Yeah, I can imagine it speaking a godly stoic tone to it. I think that's probably worth actually putting something in there. So do I put something now where the, um, probably, given it's like the showdown boss battle, I probably need to like write something about what the, and I'm not sure what, but I'm going to roll on that table now. That's what the point of this is. Let's do that, because that's meant to give me ideas when I get stuck. So in here, the uh, monster alphabet, there is a section which I just marked, and... Is it the monster alphabet or is it the dungeon alphabet that I've just made? It was the dungeon alphabet. Probably need the, uh, the dice. So yeah, I marked it. This was actually um, interesting because there's, uh, there's an adventure, a uh, famous funnel adventure, and this is a scene from it with a horrible situation for some people on chains. But I won't go into that because I don't want to spoil that published adventure there. So over here we have this detail um, that says 20 unforeseen um, situations. It's a D20, so I'll put 20 in there, and then I'll show you what's come up. 13. So 13 is, other intelligent residents of the dungeon turn up to watch the battle. They stand on the sidelines, howling encouragement with insults. So that's perfect. That will be the um, servitor kind of race of uh, cleaning, genetically created cleaning, cleaning residents that were having a bath and this kind of small albino ape-like things. So I'll say uh, they come through and they sort of start howling and watching the battle. So if the party is victorious and wins prestigious spectators large sums of gold, so they might gain unexpected benefactors. So actually maybe they'll be happy that their uh, overlords are dead and they will then aid the players if they if they win. So that's worth. I, I, I want that, but I probably want something else as well. So I'm going to just write down that, the servitor race. Race. Spectate. That makes it a bit weird as well, isn't it? That's a bit different. You know, you don't always get spectators in in a in a dungeon scene. I quite like that as a, as an idea. I wouldn't have just thought about that immediately myself, without rolling. So I'll roll again on the table. Oh, what's that going to be? Something amazing. He hopes on twenty down there. Oh, the battlefield changes dramatically. Walls suddenly appear, the combatants are teleported to a new location or they're thrown into a different world or plane. Well, that ties in with the fact that this was from a different world or plane. Unbeknownst to either side, they the fight activate a slumbering magical item or a contingency spell that chose a particular moment of their battle to take effect. So I think that would maybe be on the death of the... Um, that would be on the death of the mini sun and because rather than it being mid battle, if they slay it, um, or maybe do something with it, something will open up a portal to where Idenair was originally from, almost like giving it an opportunity to return. Um, so, yes. That's what I'm going to write up there for anyway, and just see how, it, how I roll with it. So probably, so yes, the correction is screams out instructions the ultras attack the players when they enter. So basically it is going into that sort of um, fight. And and I'm gonna say that it's like got an archaic tongue, but I'm gonna I think it's gonna understand common as well. Um, so the correction will scream out instructions in an archaic tongue um, almost barking at them. I must. I just say barking at them. And flaring uh, flaring and the surface of its sun like body flaring with hotspots of red fire.
No, oh, actually, I'll say whilst the surface of its sunlight body flares with hot spots of red fire. The ultra -nose. Stand and attack players. Enter. Based on assumption that a new food type has arrived to be cooked for them. Ooh, that's an unusual phrase that I use there. I'll just say, um, and after years of martial training provided by the correctionist. They are ready for battle. Right, then I need to mention the fact that the um, so after engaging as a battle starts increases the servitor race of Albino race of small, just try and like express what they look like in what I'm saying, the race of small albino apes. Walk through from, um, from room, I think it's room four. I better just check the room. Just I think this rooms, these rooms all need their numbering changed anyway, because they were called incorrect when they came off the dungeon generator. Yeah, room three is where they reside, and room four is their sort of home. I'll just remind myself what I called them. I haven't given them a name or stats, but I should give them some stats. Uh, oh no, that's on the that's not up above. Level two. Room seven is the entranceway, which is the wrong numbering, isn't it? Really. So the steamer bath has seen uh, can be seen in the steam bath has seen. A dozen small white beasts with four arms. They're grimming each other and stop when anyone enters. They're currently on a rest period and won't attack unless instructed. The small knee-high servants have white skin and four arms with mostly featureless face, no nose or, and no ears. Oh, they're going to have to have ears because they're going to have to hear what's the battle going on. So I'm going to say no nose and a small and only small holes for ears. Yeah, servants. So we come back down and oh, I've missed all the whole section now. So all I wanted to say is here, the servitor race of small abionites walk through from room and I've just forgotten what the room was. <laughs> Oh, I've gone up there and I started to look at something else. It's only in the last room, so it's room four. That's the cleaning room for the apes. Room three. And we'll start to... and make encouraging whelps whelps is probably not the whelps no We're encouraging noises and howls appear to have the upper hand if players win the fight they will offer to find and carry any treasures
actively seeking out items and following them through the rest of the rest of the objects. So they get some hangers on, they get some groupies basically in the form of these uh, guys. Um, and I will need to do some stats for them, even though they're going to just be basic servant type uh, beasts that were created to just sort of keep the temple clean over the uh, centuries. Um, and just like the ultra novels have sort of been kept alive and genetically, um, I don't know, spawned or something in there, I don't know. Because obviously there's very little to do inside a dungeon that you've been in for hundreds of years. Um, uh, but this sun obviously has the technology to do stuff and keep them alive. So I've said it has now managed them through nearly 20 generations within the Oblix Temple and keeps the popular set to just 11 worshipping gnolls, I'm going to say. It's originally due to being to feed and organise the religious duties. It now has uh, a deranged personality and is following a pattern of behaviour that's forgotten the worship of I don't know. Excuse me. Correctionists will scream out instructions in an archaic tongue, barking uh, when the players after noting the presence of any outsiders, uh, the correctionist will scream out instructions in an archaic tongue, barking at the ultra -nulls. Whilst the surface is sunlight body flares with hot spots and red fire, the ultra -nulls Stand and attack the players when they enter, and after years of martial training provided the correctionists, they are ready for battle. After engaging, the noise of battle increases, and and the servitor race of small abbey noites walk through from room three and will start to spectate, and make encouraging no, no, noises. I'm going to say claps, forearmed claps, because they have forearms, and howls. Oh yeah, thanks Samuel. Yeah, I thought it would be interesting to try and write an adventure online and just let these books guide me plus, you know, get ideas of my own ideas. And that's how I work. It's like a springboard, isn't it? I like really, um, you know, I've been games mastering for um, 30, how old am I? I started when I was in school, it's about 12. Games mastering for about 38 years. And yeah, I've written lots of adventures that I've played through with cat players. Um, but what I tend to do, um, just while I'm on, as an aside, is I tend to, um, you know, like some people say, do you like to homebrew or do you like, to, you know, it's a classic, all those groups on Facebook where they have sort of a stream of D&D &D memes coming up or memes even. Uh, memes screaming down the screen all the time where people like put uh, almost like clickbait comments, don't they? Who prefers... Uh, homebrew versus, um, you know, running a published adventure, and I always find that I've always mixed it up. I've never, um, I've never really had a preference. I'd be quite happy to pick up. If I was doing a D and D. I'd pick up that latest Strad uh, adventure. I ran that sort of two and a half, three years ago. It took about a year actually to uh, of gaming to to play through it. But I didn't stop. It didn't stop me adding in loads of extra stuff of my own at every step of the way. But I tell you what, if you're doing a game every week, um, it's quite handy having a published module if you're working and everything, because you can just fall back on. Oh, I just need to read a couple more chapters and detail out a few more things. But then I just like it just exploded out of that into its own campaign. Although I was using the Fair and Forgotten Realms setting, and at the moment my weekly game is a uh, is a DCC game. And I'm using uh, published adventures in that, but again, I'm mixing in old stuff at the same time. So I just sort of do both. Um, so yeah, we've, we're back down. The fight is about to start. And what I need to do is explain the tactics, uh, really, because this is quite a significant fight. But before I do the tactics, I think it's worth writing up the stats, isn't it, for the correctionist. Um, and... Uh, he doesn't have a sword, and he doesn't have these stats, so I need to find something in the book that's um, relevant for that. So I'm going to go to the main Dungeon Crawl Classics book. 
And what time have we got? I've done nearly an hour. But uh, while I do that, so if I go back, I'm going to mention a couple of other things on my desk. Yeah, so basically, the um, just some inspiration that I use just uh, while I'm on, just some books of mine from the past. This was, I guess, the um, glory. I think you'd like enjoy New Numenaria. Not an OSR, but a hell of an amazing game. Yeah, and I think you've mentioned that. Um, I should have a look at that. There's a few other things I want to look at. Um, I just have no time to at the moment, but see, there's a few other role-playing books I want to get inspiration from. So these are old books of mine. This one's come on holiday with me in the past, but it's from my heyday of like role-playing. You know, back when you were young, when I, I used to role-play with friends and we used to do a lot of Stormbringer. Um, Stormbringer is the, uh, the name of the sword belong, uh, that's used by Elric, and I have all of these old books from back then. We, I used to have the box set for the Stormbringer and also Hawk Moon, which is this one, History of the Rune Staff, which has Hawk Moon in it, which is set, set in this place, uh, which is like a, a mythic Europe, um, slightly post-apocalyptic. They have things like helicopters, but they're like those June gyrocopter type things, and they're all, it's, everything's magical. So that uh, that was a big inspiration for me. And as I say, heyday of role-playing was for me was like 80, 87 to like 90, 91, I suppose, in that uh, it's where I did all my, you know, when I was at school, I was reading these. This one is actually a re republished copy of this by Michael Moorcock. I think this is like 1989 or maybe even 90. No, it's 89. Let's say it's first, The Jewel in the Skull, the first book in there is published in 1967. So I can't quite claim to be alive when it was first published, but I'm near to it, I'm very close to it. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, fantastic book. I, I, mean, I haven't read it again recently. I, I have read it about three times, in, I think, in the past, but there's lots of good inspiration in there. And, um, you know, there's this Appendix N thing that are the references in the main Dungeon Crawl classics book. They've got a section on it, I think, in here. I think they say Appendix N references or something. Do they? Where is it? Inspiration. Because it was in the original um, Dungeons and Dragons, the whole appendix, and actually there's an adventure in there. Appendix T, I'm looking for Appendix N, and that's Appendix T, which is actually the Appendix T of the book. Here we go, inspirational uh, reading they've got in here. So they have all the classics, um, RSR resources, podcasts, third-party publishers listed. And then they actually called it Appendix N, Inspirational Reading. So they've got, you know, the first 1979 publication of AD&D uh, by Gy Gygax had a glossary and Appendix N, which had listed all of his inspirations. Um, and you can see here everything from Dying Earth by Jack Vance, uh, which is actually a book that um, they're now doing a, a Kickstarter soon, I think, on Dying Earth. Um, the uh, Goodman Games company. So for, for this setting, Dungeon Crawl Classics, Conan, Lovecraft. Um, it's got all the other, like Egg, Egg Rice Burrows and all the classics. In fact, I can't really see any Elric on there. But there you go, there's all the Moorcock books, yeah. But yeah, so Michael Moorcock was my real main um, thing at the time. I read all of every book that he had, but I, always, I also read all the other Conans and Jack Vance and everything. In fact, I wasn't a fan of Jack Vance, strangely. Although it's Vancean magic that then formed nearly everything that we know about things from magic missiles and the whole thing. But um, yeah, that's another story why I don't know why I'd never really hooked onto him. So this guy, Michael Scott Rohan, I don't think he did an awful lot of books, but this was a series called, and, and the first one was Anvil of Ice. Then you had Forge in the Forest. This is book two. I couldn't find my book one. Um, and then well, the last book is Winter of the World. And that's this is artwork by Ian Miller. I think they may have used Ian Miller on the new um, cover for the Dying Earth books for Dungeon Crawl Classics. Of course, I will be backing that. Um, so I wonder if they used Ian Miller. or John, uh, John Blanche is another similar artist, British artist. Uh, but I always like the Ian Miller sort of style. It goes around there. It's all, all sort of twisted trees, a lot of black used, um, a lot of shadow and, and vast structures, sort of chaotic style sort of structures, which are great. But this is good. This book is sort of, um, it has a Celtic feel. Michael Scott Rohan sort of writes a sort of Celtic fantasy. 
and you can see by the naming things have this so you know they have this kind of lv lv and they think things are called locks so it has that instant sort of feel of a, a celtic thing and some of the names are thunborg saldenborg that sounds sort of german celtic doesn't it but well worth looking at um i won't go into the detail of that one but they've um michael moorcock as well and this one in particular this series jewel in the scun mad god's Abulet, sword of dawn and the room stuff uh, are all great really should get a new copy but this was my copy when i was young and i say it did come on holiday i probably read it three three times maybe um and great inspiration we actually played um we were weirdos me and my friends because we didn't play really any D and we, we didn't play um your traditional games so we we, we were kfc and mostly stormbringer um and uh, you know Cthulhu and things like that. That doesn't make us weird, I know, but I mean, we a lot of people have like fond memories of like their of the nineteen late seventies and, and the whole of nineteen eighties being Dungeons and Dragons for them if they were players. And for us, we didn't really play it. We did have a couple of little campaigns of Dungeons and Dragons and, and then advanced D and D, but we never really focused on it. But actually, we went from bizarrely, we went from um, our, a very long-standing Stormbringer campaign that was like five or six years long and we skipped into a pendragon campaign after that which was very celtic focused um and sort of mythological stuff rather than um your classic dnd as well but i love it you know i like all games so it's like everybody else so where was i i was just about to get this tome over here the dungeon Crawl classics book and rather than look at those um sections i'm going to dig for the monster stuff you will cut off your legs, your arms, and your head. So here we have a section on beasts, and I'm going to try and find something that's relevant for the correctionist. Um, and just focusing in there. Yeah, thanks, Samuel. Yeah, I had quite a few uh, friends. You know, I'm not... Um, I'm not role playing with the people that I did in the eighties. Uh, I am role playing with some people I knew from the late, sort of mid to late nineties, though. So I'm still seeing them, but the very early friends of mine have sort of stopped gaming. Really, they became um, they went from because they liked the drama of it, and they used to write stories up from the uh, adventures they were doing. Um, they went on into do the uh, live action role play LARP. And they are so into it that they have vast tents. They've had the, you know, these tents, these medieval style tents. They have all of the regalia that goes with it, flags, and um, and they write stories up from that as well. They're like sort of key people in one or two of these very large groups of uh, larpers. Um, and I think that just means that they weren't, you know, they just lost interest in the table, the tabletop. They wanted to sit around a real table drinking mead in a tent by an open fire. And, and to sort of be role playing court scenes. In fact, they've sent. I've seen photos of them now, and they have these sort of amazing court scenes that look like something out of a movie. Because, you know, when LARPing started, when I first, my friends first started to get into it in like very early nineties, um, it used to be kind of primitive rubber swords, and um, you know, you'd, you'd look around the field and you'd see a lot of people just in jeans and t-shirt with like a, a top on, and it wouldn't look that great. But now they look like it's a set of a movie or something when you go to these places. So uh, people seem to have more money to put in and more time to make it uh, an amazing thing. So how am I going to create this correctionist um, in a way that um, is magical enough? And so I'm looking through just for inspiration. I think a demon maybe might be, although that <laughs> weird humped camel isn't really what I was looking for. Um, some kind of demon with an ability might dimensional sailor and dragon obviously i probably will be making a dragon from this set in the next few weeks because i have that dragon in the game and i haven't made one using this before so it'd be interesting to come up with its powers and everything elemental now there we have it a fire elemental so that's what i'm going to use plus spells or something as well an extra-dimensional analogue. 
Your world reflects infinite number of oh, so this is this is in the style of Michael Moorcock, extra dimensional analog, as in you find uh, another another version of yourself appears from somewhere. Um, but I think elemental. I think fire elemental. And we've got air elemental there. Elemental air. Where's elemental fire then? Oh, elemental fire is on this page. Let's read it and just have a look what it says. So, uh, initiative plus six, that's good. Attack, burning touch, 3d6, that's good. Flaming bolt, that matches what I want from a, a mini sun. It's got a good AC as well. Uh, massive hit dice, burning touch, vulnerable to cold, elemental traits. So all I'm going to do is kind of give it a voice and maybe give it a couple of spells in addition to... Um, it's elemental fire attacks. Just maybe pick a couple of spells. It's a shame I don't really have a... What they, what they need is a... Um, uh, not a dungeon book or a monster alphabet, like a spell alphabet or something would be great um, with some different spells to use. So I'm going to type that up now. I'm going to use that base elemental details. Brain Elder. Yeah, has it got? have they got anything like a brain? Have they got anything like that in here? You know, some kind of psionic type thing. Um, what are those ones with the kind of tentacled mouths, mind flayers? I wonder if they've got anything like a mind flayer in here as well. Would... Man bats, minosaurs, mummies. Pterodactyl serpent, servitor. So this is like a devilish creation of Chaos Lords serving their masters. I like this. They can cast cantrip at will with a plus four spell check with a paralyzing claw, which will follow up on a gnawing on their paralyzed foes. Hmm. I like the fact that I think I could give it cantrip, which would be interesting. Underdark slug, shroom, superhuman. Snake, troglodyte, troll, zombie, vombis leech. I think there's a magician in here that has a harm spell, but it doesn't sort of list other sp other spells. There's a witch as well. Um, I think because this uh, um, correctionist does teach, train, and control the creatures in there, giving it some of these witch-like sort of charm person, it's definitely not going to have darkness because <laughs> it's a mini sun. But second sight paralysis, demon summoning, mm, I quite like that. So I might give it some of the witch stuff as well. So let's switch over. This will be the last thing I probably do now. So I'll take the stats. It's going to get. Uh, the statistics of a fire elemental, basically. Um, so I'll just start working through. Fire elemental has plus six. It is going to be lawful. Um, even though a fire elemental is neutral, I'm going to say this is a lawful creature. And it has AC of 18. I'm going to take that straight from the book. It's going to have the same hit dice. Hi, Dice Tales. I'm uh, not playing here at the moment. This is me writing uh, an adventure. Oh, hi, Judge Robin. Um, hi, Jilt with Kicker. How are you? Thanks for popping in. Probably missed you for about 10 minutes because I was way into whatever I was diving off into at the time. Um, but yes, thanks for popping in, Dice Tales. This is Dungeon Crawl Classics. I'm writing an adventure. They're in one of the final boss showdowns, really, in the middle of a uh, dungeon called the Oblix where we've got some things called ultranoles, which are like humans that when they go berserk, a sort of beast form rages out of them, like a, a Egyptian beast form will rage out of them when they um, when they take any damage and they go berserk. Um, and but they have a correctionist that's like a mini sun the size of a large pumpkin or, or basketball. And I was just trying to work out what to put statistics to put on this thing. And I've decided because it's like a mini sun that's been controlling these temple followers in here for the like last few centuries, 
um, I've gone up blending it between a fire elemental and I'm going to use some witch stats for spells like charm and things because it's been controlling the minds of these worshippers. Um, so it kind of makes it a double uh, whammy that it's very powerful with its fire elemental powers um, plus it has some charms in there as well because it, it might sort of as some of these ultranols start to die it might want to start to charm players or influence them in, in some way. So I'm taking the stats now from the Fire Elemental and it's got a plus 12 melee, which is quite amazing, really. Uh, which is just called Burning Touch. So I'll say that's um, Burning Touch on here as well. Because it's a mini sun, I'm tempted to say things like it's got a hot spot attack or flare. Burning Flare, I'm going to call this one. Um, plus 12 and the damage is actually going to be 3d6 um, yeah so that's quite nasty and I'll hit dice I haven't got on there correctly yet um, it's 8d8 so yeah it's a quite a nice boss battle in terms of uh, it has its supporting minions here in these ultra Nulls. and its flight it's got um it's going to have 40 foot flight as well i'll just put fl 40 it's probably going to break the cell no let's work fl 40. so action die so i've got to give it two two action die which means it gets two action two attacks essentially as a as a boss creature and then it's got Fortitude 8, Reflex 8, and Will 8. I mean, really, this is its quite a significant thing, an elemental in uh, Dungeon Crawl Classics. Oh, that's okay. Uh, jilt with Kicker. Um, but thanks for popping in anyway. I appreciate people uh, coming in. I haven't seen before just to see me uh, create these, this, this dungeon. So it hasn't got Berserker, and it's special. But it's going to have some spells... I just copied this template and um, just a comment actually on my stat block because uh, a lot of people like the uh, uh, the sort of very clean simple stat block that uh, that you can use but I use it like this just because um, it's a box filling exercise for me while I'm doing this online uh, if I was doing it in a, in a line I'd get it wrong or I'd mix something up but on here I can see initiative 6 alignment lawful AC 18 hit dice 88 flying movement 40 so it's just nice and clean for me to see. And two action dice as well. So um, let's see what else it can do. It does have a missile fire as well. So and which is a plus eight, so slightly less likely to hit, but if it's going to stand back um, and let the um, Ultra Nulls do most of the action. Oh no, that's appreciated. Um, yeah, I think the schedule's wrong actually. That It says that I'm live tomorrow on a Sunday, but it's actually every Saturday from 11 in the morning US Eastern time and four in the afternoon UK. So, and it does damage of, for the missile fire, 2d6. So literally, as if it pulls back away and lets the fight happen with the ultra nulls, it's going to be dropping in these quite nasty uh, fiery missiles. Potentially at a rate of two around, but I'm not sure whether to say that it can only do them once. So I'm going to read this. So fire elementals are living towers of fire. Well, obviously, this isn't a living tower of fire. It's like a small nugget of a... Uh, basketball sized um, mini sun but still a t very potent and the air around them is unbearably hot and they set fire to anything they touch scorching or melting even the toughest metals any creature with touches of fire elemental whether wounded in combat or initiating may catch fire targets on uh, fire make a dc 16 reflex or take 1d6 damage each round so that that's one thing to take over uh, basically if you start engaging it you're going to start uh, catching on fire as well so i'll just write that in um, Uh, or engaging and hitting in 
a fight. Risks catching fire as large as large blasts of heat and flame escape. Mini sun's surface. And then we'll just say targets on fire, d6 reflexing, or take 1d6 one one damage each round. Can make a dc16 reflex. So that's quite nasty. Targets for fire must have there. So each round until the fire is extinguished with another D60. Uh, yeah, so the fire is only extinguished. Uh, with another DC. 16 reflex can be aided by another player. Plus four. So let's see, fire animals are immune to heat and fire based. They cannot bear the touch of water, will not pursue prey underwater across lakes. They take double damage from cold and water attacks. So I'll say the same for this. The uh, correctionist, oh, I've scrolled off the page there. Will take double damage from water or cold attacks and won't follow uh, follow anyone over or through water. Uh, it is immune to heat and fire attacks. So the special thing with this, obviously, is that I'm now I'm going to give it some spells and things too. Um, and just to have a read generally on fire elementals. So with fire elementals, wizards can attempt to take control of a freewheeled elemental. So they're not going to be able to do that with this one because it's it's got its own mind. Um, so the other thing is right in the center of it is going to be a small kind of talking fruit again obviously we've got the, the pumpkin sized mini sun but inside is maybe like an orange or a grapefruit sized um, sort of core of like a blackened metal which will be the sort of generator of this sort of ancient automaton the thing that's come from another uh, another realm so it's that sort of thing inside and I can imagine it I'm thinking in my mind you know in Star Wars there's that training thing that Luke fights against that little that little ball that fires out tiny lasers that's what it's like in the center of the correctionist like a tiny little metallic thing with pot marks and and blackened because obviously it ignites so once they've wiped it out it's not a, I'll, I'll do something along the lines of it's not going to be completely dead so once they destroy it, it'll be like a, a it would they'll extinguish it it will turn into a kind of metal chunk on the floor uh, losing its flight probably be very hot for a while molten red uh, but then once it's cooled, it could be potentially prepared. But obviously they're in a fantasy realm. They're going to have no idea how to fix this thing. But um, just thinking through ideas there for it. So now I'm going to go to the witch in the book, in the Goodman Games main book, because um, I like the idea that it, because it's been controlling and educating these ultra Ultranoles, it's going to have a few spells. Um, so I'd say, you know, the Ultranol knows a few spells, so I just roll on here. Not the Ultranol, the Correctionist. Turn that 
I'll just copy and paste it. I'm getting lazy now and hot. It's really hot here actually, but um, hopefully I'm not sweating too much. This coach just knows a few spells, has a few has a few snails to enable to control and go as the various residents of the oblix and we'll just say um, charm person and I say it's got a, it's going to have like a plus four on its spell check uh, I'm going to give it a plus eight Just before I forget to put a spell check on there when it rolls on the on the spells. I'm gonna forget. That's a, that is gonna be a good one. Forget. Um, and I think demon summoning as well. Paralysis, because if it's trying to like lock people in place as well, I'm gonna give it paralysis. Um, yeah, I wonder if it's got t telepathic ability as well. Maybe. Yeah, I quite like that idea. So it's. I don't know why I gave it so maybe Ray of Enfeeblement as well. That would and sleep. Yeah. <laughs> it's got quite an arsenal. So Ray. Now I have to remind myself how to spell enfeeblement. Uh, Ray of Enfeeblement and the last one's going to be sleep, because it will be it will again it's another controlling thing for these worshippers. Oh I'm fed up with them today. I'll just send them to sleep and I'll make them forget the, the bad behaviour that they had from yesterday. And uh, go from there so that's it so probably since I've got five minutes I'll just sort of talk about the battle so we've got already that the, the battle will the after engaging the noise of battle increases the servitor race a small albino apes walk through from room three and they start to spectate and make encouraging noises Four armed claps and howls whenever the players appear to have the upper hand against the optionals. If the players win the fight, they're offered to help them. And I say, and I'll just say, in terms of the correctionist, I'll say that it's, it obviously has some um, tactics. Um, so, correctionist will fall back away from the group. Uh, away from the strangers. Oh, I'll just say party or players, and and fire in um, fire in molten blasts of fire in molten blasts. A detonate. I don't know they'll bang when they hit. It plays, it will continue to try to put the ultra noise between itself and the players. Although any that stray near to try to charm or distract them with spells or disable them with spells once reduced to zero hit points the correct I'm just writing this in because I don't want to forget that I said this the correctionist will drop to the floor um, with just its I was going to say molten metal. I just saw it's metal core um, extinguished. 
and glowing a rosy red color. American spelling or UK? I'll go for American. Would it mind control? Yeah, so that's what I was thinking with a charm person. Um, that's what it's going to try and mind control them. Um, um, we'll try and charm or disable them to spells. Um, you know, hopefully. Uh, so once reducing this, we'll drop the floor with just its metal core extinguished and a glowing rosy red colour. So I have an idea for where the correctionist sort of resides, um, uh, that it is like a kind of a weird mechanical room with a um, like a socket which it kind of goes out and recharges itself on like a embedded uh, um, shallow impression that it can sit in and then it sort of recharges. So maybe they'll find that. But it's that machine that's broken that's made the correctionist turn kind of weird, forgetting Idenair the goddess. So maybe another thing I should do in the room, once I've got over the battle or somehow escaped or run away, whatever they've done, there's the room where the Oblix resides, its own personal room, and sits and recharges itself. They'll find there's some destruction in there. And maybe even with a primitive repair, they could do something that gets it operating in a nice way again, rather than weirdly controlling the Ultranols, thinking it's the god of the Ultranols. Truffle was just its metal core extinguished in a glazing rosy red car. Um, if returned to its metal um, nest, <laughs> I'll just to be explored, I think, to be confirmed, um, it could be uh, repaired and its odd behavior returned to being aligned with the worship of workshop worship of I don't know the goddess so there we have it um, so the battle is the idea, the Ultranols themselves are like humans, but when they take damage, they go berserk and like a, an animal form bursts out of them. I should write some examples of different animal heads and just roll them in and write them in here for the, for the judge to be able to read back and go, okay, that one's got a jackal head, that one's got an eagle head, whatever it happens to be when it turns into its rage form. Um, I quite like the fact that, you know, they're not like, like on the <laughs> like anthropy. They're not that, they're more like a, in a rage that brings out this sort of other otherworldly uh, beast head, uh, probably gifted to them by Idenea, the goddess, um, to making them into powerful, because they're powerful servants and um, defenders of the temple before it was transferred into this realm, and they worshipped her and defended her to, to, uh, to the death. So that's why they were trained in battle to, um, to, to protect her. But now they're just obviously following the correctionist because over generations it's uh, influenced what they're doing and having them follow it rather than the goddess, which is also why Idenea is fading away as a goddess because she hasn't got the followers she used to have. So the outcome is at this point, maybe if they don't kill them all, but they take out the uh, mini sun, it's when it's at that point the Ultranols um, control fails. So there we go. That's another thing which I'm going to write in uh, the battle here. Um, just as another note to myself, I won't like finalize what I'm doing here, but if I write something along the lines of if the correctionist is defeated, uh, uh, any remaining Ooh, nay, naysayer, any remaining Ultranols will stop fighting and with the party after having the spell lifted, the, the, the control I don't know, I'm not, I'm not happy with this bit to be confirmed, but the spell lifted mini sun so that that that'll do for now but i need to expand on that and uh that's it there are still a couple more rooms in there 
Well, it's funny you should say about the black hole. I'm not sure about the black hole, but I like the idea that when it dies, something catastrophic happened because we did roll that up in the um, we did roll that up in here on that page um, where it said that um, where was it? Anyway, it said that the battle triggered a transportation to another realm. So maybe when he dies, I quite like that, Samuel. Actually, maybe when he dies, it does. Um, open up some kind of black rift in the room um, above where the mini sun is and that is an, an away, a way to get back to the old realm and maybe the ultra Knolls would like to go there and so uh, Idenea might follow as well because she could be in this battle if they've pledged allegiance to her earlier on anyway so I will write that down too that's a good idea so I'll uh, just again to be confirmed in more detail but um, at the end of the fight, a, a small, small swirling rift of black energy bursts, bursts into the room with a tearing sound. And this black and shimmering. Sphere I can't remember what I called the other realm yet, but I have got a list of them. Is, is a go back to the Oblix's original realm of, and I can't remember what I called it, but I'm not going to look it up now. I'll just put that in there because I'm finishing up. So that was great. Um, so yeah, the correctionist is the real villain, and uh, so we've got the opportunity to now, you know, reunite the um, Ultra Knolls, any that haven't been slain by the players, with Idenea, because of course they'll battle her as well if she's with the party, um, and also potentially then go back. There'll be a black gateway to take the anyone that wants to go back to her original realm through. Uh, so she might want to go through. The players might want to go through. Um, I might say actually that um, after a moment, the center of the black sphere um, clears to reveal um, a series of sand dunes. A perfect azure sky above it. So this is the original original location of the Oblix Temple. That will do. All this section needs tidying up, but I think that sort of covered off the the the, the final stages of the adventure with a fight with the correctionist the fact it's got spells is bloody pretty heavy hitting as well and um also has that sort of slight technology thing going in there which i quite like even though that you know it's um ancient weird tech anyway that kind of egyptian tech you know that stuff in stargate where it's not really well it's that stargate sci-fi isn't it but i mean it, it's that kind of egyptian style thing that this uh, mini sun had come from so it's on theme with the fact it came from like a desert realm anyway. So that's it then. So oh. I'm go back to there and just have the desktop up again. And just say, yeah, thanks very much for listening in. That's been an hour and a half of more Dungeon Crawl Classics. I think I've enjoyed making a couple of, uh, make, making that mini sun creature and using the fire elemental. I had no idea I was going to use a fire elemental. There was me working on a, a creature the size of like a, a basketball that was like a mini sun. And I didn't instantly think that I should use a fire elemental until I actually ran, landed on the page. And it's perfect for it. It's really hard. Uh, it's a good sort of boss battle fight with uh, its supporters there as well. So, yeah, that was great. So thanks very much, everybody, for listening in. And, um, well, I'm going to, since I've got the time, I'm going to bang the gong to end proceedings just like I started.
try not to make a massive crash when I put this down. Although, although the crash is quite an interesting noise, especially when my headphones get stuck in it as well. So thanks, I'm now going to stop the stream, so I uh, need to find out where I press the button now. Stop streaming. Goodbye, thanks.